Thanks for coming on the Gnostic Warrior today, Lay. How you doing? It's my great pleasure. Great to see you, Mo. Great to see you. And it's really awesome the work that you've been doing over the years. I remember you, you know, before we started this interview, I told you from the Dallas days, right? And I know there's a lot of people that don't know you from that, but your work entails a lot more than Hollywood. Um, right. But I want you to kind of educate us a little bit about your path um, beginning in, you know, before Hollywood and what you were doing there to, to now. Well, I can give you a, a bit of an overview of, uh, I really believe what's added up to a, a, a creative life, meaning a, an examined life. But I started out very fortunately in where I lived in terms of what was important to my parents. My father was an artist and my mother was a teacher. And so I grew up around a sense that creativity, uh, imagination need to be honored and cultivated. And, and I grew up uh, actually two miles from where I live now, but it was much more uh, close to nature. So I grew up with a lot of love of nature and um, I, I'm near the beach. Uh, and so I, I went to the beach, uh, not really to be a beach person, but really to invoke and to stimulate what I would say the sort of the romance of it all uh, as because I was a bit of a loner. But I was always uh, very attracted to acting. I missed my cue. I always say I missed my cue in kindergarten in a PTA play, and it, it put a bug in me. I've got to get back on stage. So my love, my passion, my first love was acting, and and I pursued it in school. I, I, went, uh, I got through high school early, so I went off to uh, Cal State Northridge and then decided to audition for uh, acting schools and ended up at the Juilliard School in New York, which was a a really great experience. My classmates were Robin Williams. My roommate was Kelsey Grammer. So there was a lot of people that ended up having a remarkable influence on the industry and in a way the, the culture of the time. But I was always, uh, always very deeply inward. I, I had experiences that I think many uh, young people have of, uh, of a lot of things churning inwardly that could not be expressed outwardly. And I, from about 14 to the age of about 23, had nightmares. I had every night. So I, I was really uh, thrust into my unconscious, so to speak. And I always like to say, I knew I wasn't crazy, but <laughs> it was that sense that, that the very uh, experience is going to teach you how to navigate it. Because there are, it's like acting. There's no way to teach one how to do it. You must teach an individual or offer an individual a sense of how they can connect to their own resource because they must bring it out of their inner life into the expression. So um, when I when I was off in, in New York at Juilliard, I, I, I was very fortunate because I met an agent. I, I, and I came back and started in Hollywood when I was about 20 and did, as you said, Dallas. I, I did the first nighttime soap opera, which was called Executive Sweep back in 1975. And then some groundbreaking and important movies for the time. There were TV films called Alexander, The Other Side of Dawn. I played Alexander and Dawn, part of a teenage runaway. It was about street hustlers and, and, and uh, young runaways. And it, it tried to, as I said, in the 70s, they were trying to grapple with social issues. And in the 80s, it went to Love Boat and really sort of more of the Reagan years of we're not going to look at the dark, we're gonna emphasize the light. So things went in a different direction. I did Dallas in those years. And then was able to work uh, in, in a lot of different ways. I, I did uh, things like General Hospital, Young and the Restless, all of these different shows. But I was always working in terms of, of the deeper creative need of, of my, my soul, which was I had grown up uh, around my father had been one of the founders of the Malibu Art Association. And he always said that creative people have to get together and inspire each other. We do enough critique for ourselves. That's what I, I really do feel. We critique ourselves. So when we get together, let's inspire us. So uh, when we moved here in 1981, I started discussion groups. This is when I was doing Dallas. But I was, I was, it was, began as a theosophical discussion group, reading the works of Blavatsky and, um, and uh, the writings of William Q. Judge. But they were a deep inquiry into esoteric um, philosophy. And I had that discussion group in my house for 25 years. So we ended up uh, over a nine-year period reading The Secret Doctrine, which is about 1,100, 1,200-page book. But it was great because I was able to balance the outer world's call as an actor, which really isn't interested in these deeper qualities because it's a business. They're interested in sales and what appeals to whom and why. And when you understand that that's the nature of the game, you're not trying to change the game. You're trying to take 
that. And what I did is I realized it was a patron, as in the old days. I could work as an actor, which afforded me an opportunity to then use my home as a gathering point for other creative uh, and imaginative, thoughtful people. They're not all actors. They were from all, you know, from, from paramedics to uh, lawyers to doctors to, to academics. So it wasn't just one group of people. I called them uh, the gathering of the curious, the ones that would show up and say, at least let these things matter to us. And that's primarily what has been the nature of my life is to balance what I found uh, in the acting world and its demands and the demands of the inner life, the inner world. And I really have always been profoundly inspired and fascinated about what is the inner self? Who are we then? Why are we here? And my father really taught me another tool. He said, because I was asking about art. I always loved drawing. I always loved painting. And, but I, I was an actor. And he said, I want you to use your art as a way of asking questions. Use your pen and your brush as, as uh, the way of, of creating inquiry. And I started using this as an actor when I was in Juilliard. I couldn't connect to anger in a way. So I started throwing paint at the canvas. You know, I used it as, as a type of medium, not uh, to be an artist, not to be, but to actually connect with something material. And I found that connection to breath, to the materiality, had a great relationship to acting and emotion. It was about connecting. So from that premise, in a sense, connecting to breath, all of my art, which is quite uh, enormous at this point, has, has emerged. But it was in the act of trying to not illustrate something, but to connect to the energies that create the outer form. So that's, that's, really, that's a long introduction of self, but it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's getting there. <laughs> Yeah, Leigh, and it's important that you you have that long introduction because you know this is this is your podium, you know, and I want people to have a grasp of of your path, you know. So it's great for you to to give us, um, you know, an explanation of that. And what I find interesting is that many artists and, and actors, and you mentioned someone you went to acting school with, Robin Williams. A lot of them are loners like yourself, and I'm finding, you know, on the internet, a lot of us that are maybe into the, the Gnostic theosophical um, type of stuff or medical were somewhat loners in, in our, in our societies or in our cities. And we're kind of looking for people to meet up and you actually had one of the first meetups before the internet, right? You were, you were hosting those in, in Malibu. So you were seeking others like you that were seeking knowledge and seeking to know thyself. It, it seems like, you know, and that was kind of the struggle that you were having with who you were on the inside with how the game was you, you mentioned, right. And I'm right. sure in, in Hollywood is it's much more of a game. So it's just really, really intriguing to me that a lot of the greatest artists are loners, you know, and here we are again, two loners kind of talking with one another. Um, you know, I really could relate with that statement, but what I find fascinating is how you could be such a loner and an outsider but be on the inside, right? Yeah. That's one of the toughest things for me personally is to kind of play the game mm -hmm. and be true to myself. Yeah, yeah. And what I would like you to kind of explain is how do you do it, Leigh? How do you, you be true to yourself while you still play the game and you don't lose your soul uh, while you play? I, I really believe that, that the world is asking us for balance, not for the uh, exclusion of things, but the inclusion. The question is how do we navigate our circumstance so what my my question and why i love talking about it now because i can look at my life and see a shape that while i was going through it i was more following uh the the impulse but not seeing necessarily more like a detective saying i've got lots of clues but i've not been able quite to put this question together but what is really remarkable is that my home has answered a lot of the questions about how do we balance? Because it really be, has become, on 9-11-2001, I started uh, when the collapse of the towers and, and this, this collapse of the human heart, this relationship to the falling away of money and God. I thought I wanted more, but I realized that really what I wanted was to be with those I love. I don't want to leave. I want to stay. That was a part of a riddle that I think had to be come out of this collective trauma. What do we do when there's no higher to reach, when getting everything you think you have has separated you from 
the earth from where you live. In a sense, it's a false erection, quite literally. And this, I, this, this falling back to earth and this creation of what called it, it announced itself as the hieroglyph of the human soul, as I started with the emergence of a spontaneous language. And again, with acting, what is great, and with music, you learn about the key is improvisation. And this is really what I took to my art. I allowed it to be my mentor, not to illustrate and say, oh, this is what I'm going to illustrate, and you need to know this, Mo. It was much more like the development of a character. I don't know how to play Hamlet, so what I do is I give myself to the rehearsal, I start to assimilate, and it starts to emerge. And that's what this language, the watcher language emerged with the story that we are finally going to begin to perceive that we have left ourselves out of the picture. We don't begin where we live, we begin where we work. So we strive to have an identity based in an outer world awareness of who and what we are. But the symbolism that for me on 9-11 happened was it was like Michelangelo on the ceiling shouting at popes and gods, in a sense, this great vaulted importance of art and one's relationship to these things. And 9-11 for me was that the artist falling off the scaffolding onto his knees and saying, I really, what I think of God or popes doesn't matter anymore. What matters is I love my wife and my children. And for me, that was the great impetus. I said, I, have to, I looked at Carla, my wife, and my two daughters, and I said, it's your love that's healed me. Your love has brought me home. Your love has made this tree, so the roots do not want to leave. I want to stay. And in that moment, I realized what was shifting was this narrative of, of where we think we have been going and why. The room told me that I was building an ark of the human imagination, that the last flood was water, and this flood is information and the fire of the human imagination misdirected, when we, are, when we know what we hate, but we have forgotten what we love. The fires came to our door, and Carla and I stayed when they came on November 9th, which was two years to the day of the election. And if you don't think of it politically, but think of it in terms of the anger of it all, the rage and the fire burns, and it burns all the way to the coast. It burns, and my house is right near the coast. I can see the ocean. And the symbolism is, in this story, if we look at art as it representing in its, its place, a story we should listen to, because it says, what I want you to pay attention to here is the art here is in domestic space. It's in private space. It's not being created for a pope. It's not being created for a collector or for, in a sense, a political reaction to a disagreement with the neighbor. It's coming out of what I think is a much more primal sense. I even call myself the last of the cave painters because everything I do, paint, is our first language. And paint was never to illustrate. It was always to commune. That's why the painted caves, when you see the handprints, they were quite literally touching the skin of the ancient. That was the permanent impression. This is how we create permanent bridging with these greater, deeper energies that, as the stone would say, I do not have a mouth, you do. I do not sing, you do. But trust my energy. I am the foundation of who you are. So trust the power of your true eternal nature and sing while you are here. This is something that we have forgotten, the sense of rapport, because we are very disconnected and, and very much in our heads and optically fixated on things. And the key of the room is that it's a very large library that I've collected. And if we think about the, the metaphor of a library, a library says, I'm not interested in your opinion of the books. The conversation of who you are as human is far more interesting than your opinion of it. So in the library, I don't want you to tell me which books you would burn or why you hate those characters in that play or why you're better than those books. I want you to take a break and sit in the library quietly and realize you're part of an enormous conversation called what does it mean to be human? And if you think about that as the key, what does it mean to be human? Brings us finally back home. I wish I could decide for you, Mo, or for my neighbor. I wish I could tell the politicians what is wrong. Yeah. But I have to more like a gardener. And why did the old alchemists call themselves celestial gardeners? Because they said, we don't plant false magic and optical illusions. We plant the seed of grace and we attend it. And if we are worthy of her, she will reveal 
her secrets. There was no entitlement. There was no taking. I'm an old Grail Knight, not a not a not a soldier looking for an authority. A Grail Knight, like a Bushido warrior, says, "I respond in kind, but I do not respond in cruelty." This is not the etiquette of energy, and so a lot of my art is bringing people finally back into a context. They come into my home because I have a lot of um, uh, showings, a lot of gatherings, and a lot of a lot of um, events here. And one of the things I love sharing is the fact that people come into a private space, a home, and you feel safer. And when I was working with actors as a director, I said, the first thing I want you to do, I want to create safe space so we can go anywhere together. No, I have your back. No critique here. We're going to explore these things. So this is really my sort of agreement field. I've had 39 years of discussion groups every single Tuesday night. That is up in the thousands. And then Thursday night as well. So I've, I've literally gathered these books, gathered the energy of people like ourselves that you say are pretty much loners because if you care about these things, as I say, you rush out of the world and you say, this is extraordinary, isn't it? And people look at you blankly and go, no. And if you keep talking about it, they become very nervous and then angry and then actually probably possibly dangerous. So you have to begin to say, who is it that is interested in these things. I tell people when they come visit now, I say, I want you to look around because we're convinced in the world that nobody cares about these things. So I want you to look at each other and say, we care about these things. Because if we begin like this, this is what, if we understand the physics of consciousness. It's a bit like a million degrees of, of dispersion of energy and anger does nothing. It just starts wildfires. The only thing, or sets Notre Dame on fire, these are the qualities of human consciousness when anger is let loose without any focus. And everything in this story is how do we turn the fire down? How do we, and that was after the fire came here. It was, it devastated, took out 170 homes all around us. And it, but in staying, it said, tell me what you hate and I'll burn down your house. Meaning it was an inner sense that our anger as human has become so great our hatred, of, it said, you know what you hate, everyone knows what they hate, but have forgotten what they love. They're not looking to their neighbor, they're looking to what they hate about their neighbor. And this is very dangerous territory, but this is also very, it's when in a way the matrix is, is in stress, is the time that we, those that do care about these things, must see it as a time of planting seeds. So to bring it back to my home, We've been here, as I say, for 39 years. My downstairs, I have a studio downstairs that I built for my father, so the son's room for the father. In that room, I have 17 years of work. I did, I did the 22 drawings for the major arcana of the tarot, and I wrote a book, Tarot Revision. Uh, I'll say immodestly, it was reviewed as possibly the most significant contribution to the tradition in over 100 years, and I would agree because it's a true labor of love. I didn't enter it to tell you what I thought I knew about tarot. I wasn't even interested in, in, a, in a way in, in all of the say, fortune telling side because as an actor, I said, the last thing I need is to read my fortune and say, oh, tonight's performance is going to suck. <laughs> hey, thanks a lot. That was helpful. And so I always look at all of these symbolical arts as a way of inspiring us to do the work, not to listen to someone else's uh, advice that, that probably is, is more projection of what they're thinking than, than something that's actually beneficial. So that's why as I went into the tarot and downstairs and spending 17 years on it, it was uh, because it wasn't based on the artwork of others. It was based solely on going into the tradition. But I also was not going in thinking that, that I would find something there and thought I will be done in a few weeks. I not only found something there, it changed my entire understanding of how we are wired that the archetypes, the nature of the 22 spokes of the wheel, help us understand the theater of the psyche, the inner Shakespearean play going on inside of each of us. But I liken this also to an instrument. The tarot, if we think of it as a piano, it has the black and white keys, and each note is a different character. One is the devil, one's the empress, one's the emperor, one is the tower. And if we begin to understand that they are around us, meaning they're always there, we'll begin to understand even the fascinating symbolism of why my tarot is in black and white. I didn't know why when I began, but now I understand completely because it's about, as in the Wizard of Oz, the black and white world. 
that we're navigating always the Kansas of reality, meaning it's always black and white. There's always people we don't like. And so the question is not, what do you hate? Who do you not like? It's how do you navigate that reality? How do we navigate life without looking at the world and saying it should have color there, it should have color there, because it's like a piano. It says, no, the world is black and white. It's your playing of that that allows the world to have color. This is why the arts are so important, music, poetry, because that's when we allow that black and white world, which cannot be resolved in itself any more than the piano keys sitting next to one another can be resolved. What resolves them is to use them as a way to access through, you'd say, improvisation, a willingness to uh, enter the question and not know allows it to begin to grow. Again, this is why my, my, my uh, I don't have a magician in my tarot. It is a magus. It's a seed, not a trickster. So this is why the foundation becomes the below is the black and white, the structure. The above, for me, is the studio above, which is the hieroglyph of the human soul, as it calls itself. But it's a painting that is also multidimensional with 3D glasses. So we have the below and the above. And if we think of the below here, as the structure, meaning it's always the same in every age, but the above being the library, the human imagination, we begin to realize that, that what we have been doing for ages is three different questions. One is domestic responsibility. One is structure or the responsibility to the outer world. And the third is the human imagination. In this setting, in my home, they all become one house. And this is very good symbolically. Joseph Campbell or Carl Jung, anyone that speaks in these symbolical terms would say, yes, the psyche is represented by your home. And in this, because the art is here, and it's not about the artist, it's really because art is the creative spirit. It says the creative spirit here used this setting to say, I needed 17 years below, and then the fire starts here, arrives here 17 years above. So for 34 years, all of this ha relationship has been building to finally allow us to realize that we keep our feet in structure, the black and white, the knowledge of the father, the knowledge of the difference of things, the knowledge of the keys of the notes. This allows us then to hold the middle section, which is the domestic responsibility, the heart, the, the sense of love. I love these people because love keeps your feet on the ground and your head on your shoulders. So here when we ascend upstairs in this, this narrative into the, the higher, into the library, into the hieroglyph, we ascend back into a painted cave, a primary condition that says, we humans are finally going to be able to balance above and below structure and imagination, because what will keep it together is not the desire to leave or use the imagination as an act of escape, but use it as an act of focus. And when you talk about Gnosticism, you talk about this relationship to the Gnostic tradition, this is why it was so important that there would be different straws, different people chosen so that the spontaneity of the energy would be allowed to voice itself. This is why I've always been a bit like Arthur. I've always had round tables here. And I've always <laughs> relied on my nights, really on that sense of, we put the grail in the center, this greater sense that yes, it's not which one of us is it, but each of us are uniquely whole and holy. And therefore, as we come together in ensemble, we allow the greater truth to be revealed, not through one of us, but through the magic of all of us. And this is sort of the relationship here. I got to stop you there because that was beautiful. And um, that really summed up everything that you had said right now. And I want to let you know a lot of what you're saying I, I resonate with, and I'm sh certain a lot of the listeners do. What I'm finding hard, you know, and, and I love how you mentioned the philosophers and how we're like conduits for this energy and this knowledge and this information. And what I find hard is, is taking the ego and that what I hate about this and looking out and taking that out of the equation. But I'm realizing that that is what it's about. It's not about me. It's about me being a conduit, you know, and, and connecting with like minds, but we all have different things to, to bring to the table. What I've found in doing so, though, Lay, is that we all have these good intentions myself, but we all seem to conflict with one another um, in one way or another. I'm not saying all relationships, but what I'm finding outside of my family 
it's hard to resonate and connect with people without those egos or without those secret prejudice com- coming in. And, and I'm guilty of that myself. And I, I'm trying to work it out. You know, again, I'm 47 years old. I've had a, not a long path as far as in Gnosticism and, and learning philosophy and how to live. So it feels like I'm just like a, an immature little child trying to learn this, this great wisdom. And then I realized that this game out there, you know, you mentioned the Magi, I'm trying to be a Magi in a world of tricksters, you know, and that's the game that I'm in. And, and I really loathe that, you know, lay so that that part of me really wants to kind of destroy that. But that's how the game's being played. So I'm like, constantly is this dichotomy of being who I truly want to be, and being true to the knowledge and the gnosis. And then you know, immediately having to go out, I'm an entrepreneur, I have my own business here in San Diego, and have to play with the tricksters and and with the games. So that's every day is like that for me. So I'm it's really hard for me to find balance. And to to really be me. So what advice do you have for those people out there that might not have the luxury, you know, have the path that you're in or or doing what you're doing, and and they have to play the game daily, um, but they want to be the magi and not a trickster? I believe very much now that that we do have to be the cultivators of our own circumstance. Like, I think it's probably very good that you're doing this in terms of the conversation because it keeps that quality alive. One of the things that I found, and I have to say my, my Tuesday night group, it's been different people over you know, it's 39 years now, but but people have come through, some have stayed, some have been... But there was always this this focus of, and I would always use a book, um, like my one group, we're, we're going to be reading the Pista Sophia, um, just, and we, we um, are, are reading um, Jung's The Red Book. We, you know, so there's a lot of things that, that we've been reading, and I find that by creating a sense of that we value these things, it creates a place where these things can be valued. I think it's very important, though, that what you're saying is that you're being very honest with yourself. And I think that's what we need in the world. The world is, I feel this very strongly now, is that it is in a state of chaos. And that like the tarot, if we think of the outer world wheel as spinning, we can follow the action of the outer world and be swept away by it because it takes us away from where we are centered, where we are. But if you think of it as a martial art lesson, meaning that that it's by the extreme difficulty that you will learn how you can pull back into that sense of this matters to me. It does not have to matter to you, but it matters to me. Even in saying that, we allow that quality within ourselves to find residence and not take, even you'd say the rejection of the world that is going so quickly, it has no time for depth you know, like a, like a bug that can't get, you know, it, and it, it only wants to see what it is in self-reflection, not in depth. When we begin to understand that, I do think we begin more as the, the Gnostics once did, which is that certain conversations you must have with those, like a gardening club. You know, if you had a bunch of people that hate gardens, you wouldn't want them in your garden club because you'd say, I think the energy here is a little off. Because many of the ideas, you know, if you're just about what you hate and what you like, it's about your opinion. It's, oh, I don't like that. Well, so what? I mean, this is what, what you know, I'd say the first medicine, get over your opinion. It doesn't matter. And no one cares. Neither should you. Because if you start examining what you're so opinionated about, half of the time you'll realize, why is that even my opinion? I don't have, I don't even agree with that. It has us. We don't have it. So <laughs> this is. And that's why I do. I feel we're in a time where there can be clarity because we can start to say, as in the ancient texts, become a knower of the real. Like, what's pushing my buttons? Oh, all right. I get it. Turn off the TV. <laughs> Let me go back to pulling back. If you're in something with people that, that you have to just bring it down to 10% to get through, do. I mean, I found that as an actor. I found that, you know, producers got very confused if you went in and started getting very philosophical with them. They think, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a coach here. <laughs> you know, I'm looking for this part you're playing. You know, so, so you have to understand those dynamics. But that's one of the keys. I think that, that everything in my work has said, and even my work over the discussion groups, that we've gone through a very long process of individuation, meaning who am I? What is my work? What is my... 
And we come to the end of that journey. And if you think of a play saying, listen, I want you to realize your character in a play, but the play's the thing. So when you find yourself involved with these circumstances, the circumstances are, are actually including us, I believe, as a character in a larger conversation. And if that happens, then we're able to turn away from it being about me as opposed to turning back into the conversation and saying, oh, I see, I'm part of a larger, uh, in a way, a context and problem. Like, I want to honor people that are going through difficulty and saying your heroism is your willingness to go through it. And you are being taught by the confusion and the not knowing, because if there was a way to do it right, we would have done it right a long time ago. There's only a way to do it lovingly, to do it meaningfully, because our humanity is based on essentially the quest to find meaning in our life. How do we do that? And that's why I feel like, like the things that drain meaning, we need to, in a way, put on our suit and just walk through it. And then to bring back, though, when I return home, I step back into my roots. And what I love about the art in the studio here is it's painted on linoleum, a linoleum floor, and it's um, the entire room in a ranch-style house because the greater symbolism there is that um, uh, we think we're linoleum. You know, we're, we didn't turn out to be golden. We, we turned out to be ordinary and... Um, and, and that, that we're ranch style, you know, we're human scale, you know, we don't impress the senators. And as I like to say, we came from times of fighting dragons. Now we're fighting low self-esteem and traffic, you know, and I do feel like it's, it's pulling us back to you're the gold. Your imagination will free you if you give it a place as a gardener, not to impress the neighbors, not to convince others you're right and they're wrong, not to use it as a tool to say, this is what God means, but to say, you know what? This is my private relationship with the creative spirit. And I want to find that maybe just between me and the creative spirit, we can have something that says, I've been waiting for a long time for you to stop looking for me in a group of others and realize that any time we spend in intimate relationship is how we, almost like a yoga, begin to tell the universe, you know what, I realize it's a very chaotic world, but this matters to me. And we just like watering a garden say, this matters to me. This matters to me. And because of that, on a, on a quantum level, we begin to shift from a center of it's never there to I'm slowly building. And that's what the, 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 this, this whole home is now. And the people can feel it. It took decades to manifest. It couldn't tell its story until we lived through it. Now, think of our lives like that. I can't tell you until you, you live through it. When my dad died, I saw his book being squeezed and said, and I put back on the shelf and I said, ah, but now it's been lived. And I thought, man, that's what we've forgotten. The heroism of the willingness to enter the difficulty, to realize the difficulty will transform us because we'll be far more interesting than we thought we would have been without it. Do you know? And that's, that's if you think about it, our art comes from our despair. You know, what do I do with it? I don't know, write some blues, maybe. We'll sing together. <laughs> Oh, I don't hear you. Um, Actually, I, I, I muted it for a second. I, um, my oh, kids are in the back room and they started yelling back there. So <laughs> sometimes I got to use the, the mute. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in any event, Lay, um, you know, what really interests me is that, you know, on the loner status, I know you're still somewhat not Mr. Social guy out there, but you invite people into your sanctuary, right? And to me, that seems a little bit not, it would be odd for me to invite people in here because I'm, I'm totally like, I got to know you. I got to know what you're about before yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you could stay in my house. So um, what has made it to where you feel comfortable? Because you know about energy and everything and how the world works, right? Um, mm -hmm. I believe much more than we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. And you allow people that possibly are strangers um, mm -hmm. not knowing their intent coming into your home um, and you've seemed very happy and peaceful there and everything's cool. So explain to me personally, and I'm sure there's other people, how you do that and how you feel comfortable and how you maintain that. It, it, I've always had, even uh, again, going back to the early theosophy days, I've always had an open my home to um, people coming and I have never had 
trouble. I mean, I've had to every now and then, you know, like anything, you have to put your foot down sometimes, but, but very rarely, most people are very, especially if you invite them into your home, they're very, you know, they're very honoring, they're receptive, they're not, they're not coming with an agenda, because most people that would respond with an agenda wouldn't respond to something. Open. To an invite, right? To an invite. It's like almost being disarmed by your welcome as opposed to, oh, I, I, you know, and, and sure. I found that very therapeutic with a lot of people because they really do. I think they feel very strongly about their home. Like, gosh, you let people come into your home. And, and, but it has become this much deeper sense of a place of community. And, it, and therefore, it's gathered like community. In a way, the people that have found out about it, that are interested in coming, are people that I do feel that, that what it offers them, and it's important, is an affirmation that we have been holding and often living alone with these very precious insights or feelings or, or desires in terms of, of, of the world, um, and yet not knowing how to connect or feeling, again, very isolated that there isn't a connection. And that's why I, I feel very strongly that the, the symbolism of my home has grown because it has always been a, a node. And I know there are other nodes. There are other people that are created. I, I, there are different centers based around a different uh, quality of, of, of fascination and interest. But I looked at them. I wrote a number of years ago called Notes on the Emerging Renaissance. And it was this realization that, that we are in a time of what I call island building, meaning that when we look, we'll see that there are different clusters of people who find a particular subject really fascinating, and they're honoring it. But the subject itself isn't large, but it's very intense. Now, when we start putting these different nodes together, like, like a necklace, we'll begin to get, see how renaissance or rebirth comes from not from one outside source but from a lot of sources holding on to their own part in the play so that's why i did find my house was and i think by nature I, i'm naturally a community um of mind person my wife is more uh, the community of of malibu you know of the of the and it's a great combination because in a way it covers the quality of, of the inner life and the outer life of community in terms of the troubles of the community uh, on just say a daily political basis. And then the troubles of community of, we have to honor that which inspires us and give ourselves a place to do it. And, and that's why I, I just feel it's like, start with the people that do share uh, an empathy or an interest in these things and and gather in a in a small way. You might even start start at, like at a coffee house. I mean, just yeah. something. But use a book, use well, some author. Don't just have a salon. It'll last three weeks and die. You yeah. have to use an author because then the people aren't just in a way unloading their opinions, which a lot of people want to do. But then it, they're done. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you want to engage them in what pulls them past their opinion because everyone's so darn smart in the first meeting, <laughs> and they give away and they go ah and that's like with actors now we begin <laughs> sure. you know Lay, it's, it's really interesting that some of the happiest times that i have now are, are most most fulfilling are actually having these types of conversations with people that i i don't even really know and you know like right now um I, i'm getting goosebumps here and there when you're saying certain things to me i'm resonating with a lot of things certain things in my life are making sense by your words um, and I get a lot of knowledge and I learn from every single person and it's a blessing every time. But then again, I also know that there's going to be thousands of people that listen to this podcast and that are on the internet that are seeking knowledge that are lonely. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm seeing that it's about conversations, about, about real conversations. Mm -hmm. And my coffee house right now for now is this really, you know, and um, this is something that I've created and done. And I, I feel like it needs to get bigger, but other people need to talk. So it's interesting that you've created this in Malibu. You've been doing it for decades now, and you're still doing it. And it's about real communication, real connections, and sharing this, this knowledge. You know, So we don't have that on the internet, the internet generation, the millennials, and so forth. I see that it's built on a lot of kind of fake, not fake relationships, but kind of superficial um, built in the cloud, right? And 
it's hard to fill the heart. It's, it seems like we're stuck in our head on this, this internet right here. Um, so it's, it's, there's, there's a, there's an illness I, I feel. And I suffer from it too, because a lot of my work is on the internet and I'm spending way too much time on here. I'm imbalanced. Um, and I know you're, you know, probably an easy solution is turn it off, but for some people it's hard to turn off. Yeah. And then some, some of us are just seeking people and connections and we're lonely, you know? Yeah. So, um, I guess what is the advice that you have for some of those people out there, such as myself, you know, again, I'm starting these podcasts. It's helping me tremendously. I'm learning from great people like you. What can other people do out there? Um, should they do meetups? Should they find meetups? Um, it seems like that's the best thing to do because we're getting stuck in these pointless conversations on the internet that go nowhere sometimes, you know? Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I, I think, I think the key is that because we are each different and, and a bit like uh, needing different energies, different uh, qualities, but note that as you start to express your interest, like with the podcast, that people come, like, like we're talking today, that's the magnetism, your interest, it, your willingness to create a place of, at least here, let these things matter. Let this be where these things are, uh, for me, what I need in my life. And I think that because I keep feeling and hearing quite inwardly, give me material to work with. What we think of as imagination, if we think from a physics point of view, is actually quantum energy. Quantum energy is like a stem cell, meaning it will take on whatever we project into it. So it's not necessarily projecting a large messianic vision of the world needs to change, but the seed intention of, of I want to draw forth conversation that nourishes me. And they quite literally tell consciousness, life this, and maybe do that with not some ritual that you're, you're making some false magic, but more the ritual of attention. Like even with a seed, let this seed draw forth the, 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 those that nourish a sense of yes. I will say it's, you know, those that nourish yes rather than yikes. Because if we tell, you know, this is where a lot of trauma, working with trauma, that that we really are able to begin to give ourselves, to put a, our arm around ourselves. And this is what I find, you know, like, an, like your elder self is in there, but an arm around you, you go, hey, Mo, you know what? Relax. Don't take it too hard. You know, don't take it personally. The world isn't personal. You are the navigator. You're the captain of the ship of your life. So it's not about um, where this or that. It's about really about how do I do the things that allow me to navigate my, 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 not only my life, but navigate and nourish my, my inner self, my inner needs. And that I feel it's like changing a diet, right? Once you start to give like this, like I tell people, don't be an artist to be an artist. That's nonsensical, but use any creative tool as a way of connecting with your breath, connecting with, because once you get something out of you, even, you are allowing yourself to see yourself. You're not just keeping it inside. And if you don't make it about, oh, this is about me and this is messy or this is like a lot of times I have people finger paint because I want to get them away from this into their hands. These are not my hands. These are human hands. This is my hand, but it's a human hand. And when you understand the difference, you begin to understand that this hand is capable of everything the human hand has ever created, which means it's a very important tool and I should trust it more than just doing this with it. Do you know, to really understand the relationship to touch, the relationship to getting back into the body. I do feel that we are so numbed and why people are, are so devoted, in a sense, why there's a fetish for violence now and cruelty in movies. I mean, it's just over the top, but it's because of the numbness. And Wordsworth said it best, the greater th uh, cheap thrill the imagination needs to be activated by degree, the less imagination one has access to. And we are constantly being beaten by energies that are trying to distract us, trying to say, I'm more important than I actually am. But if you think of it, I, I call my, uh, it a mental martial art. Everything around us, think of being a hologram. Everything is there. And in the hologram, it says, I can't teach you what to pay attention to because it's not optical, it's energetic. But if you're paying attention to this, at the end of paying attention, are you dissipated? 
Have you lost your energy? Have you given your energy over to anger at the end of a political angry debate? Do you feel alive and awake and hopeful or depressed and angry and resentful? These are markers that we really have to pay attention to. I don't like feeling like this. I like the story of being human better when I tell this one to myself that I do have a purpose, that I am a human form divine, that I am the outcome of a great question asked across the ages, what does it mean to be human? And the greatest gift is our DNA, that we are woven of the entire story. So do you see, this is why a lot of the ways I believe we are enslaved and entrapped is because we have so limited the perception of who and what we think because we're always this way in media right? It's always I, thou, I, thou, I, thou. How many likes? How many dislikes? How did I? But that, if we think, is like we finally push back saying that's there. As you say, it is part of our life. But we begin to say it will not be my life. It will not be my identity. And if I find myself over identifying with it, I realize no one's going to tell me not to accept me. So I have to be a custodian. And that's why I think even with everything now, I feel it's about understanding we must be custodians of our experience mental martial arts i like that one you know yeah and i like the the idea you know that's totally gnostic matrix style that the idea of you're a hologram in this holographic universe and and they're all around you you know and you've got to control what you're paying attention to and we all have that power i find it interesting that even though we all have that power a lot of us including myself, I'm guilty. Of course, you know, I, I keep bringing myself into this, but I know that a lot of people relate with that lay and, and you're a little older and wiser in my opinion. Okay. So I, I love to, to pick, pick your brain and we're going to get into a lot of the good work you're doing now. And of course, your, your fantastic art studio that you, you have there um, that you've been talking about. But I find it interesting that we know this, but yet we're going towards it seems like this this path of destruction you know the the addiction to the computers the phones the likes everything again i'm guilty of it too you know i'm trying to play i'm playing the game online right i've, I've got to have my my podcast i'm competing with a million podcasts i'm doing this i'm doing that and it's all based on that game yeah. you know and then when you're 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 trying to take yourself out of it but you're inserted into the game it's it's just this this weird dichotomy you know it's it's you're you're paying attention to things you don't want to pay attention to because you have to. But, you know, again, I chose to to do this website, to do this podcast, to go online. Um, and sometimes I, I don't know exactly why, but, you know, again, I like that idea of the hologram and, um, you know, looking at and paying attention and, and we get to choose what we want to pay attention to and um, understanding also the triggers, what triggers us and so forth and, and taking a look, ecstasis outside of ourselves, looking at ourselves, what we're doing, um, pay attention to that. You know, it's really important. Um, you know, you talk about uh, the mystery of the tarot, um, which is important, but share with us the story of the hieroglyph of the human soul and it's Thoth's library, which is, of course is where you're at now. Can you explain that? Yeah, and you can see the heron. This is the, the reoccurring motif, which is also having to do with Thoth Hermes and, and the herald that, uh, of the the heron, which is the uh, for the ancient Egyptians was the phoenix. So a lot of this plays into uh, an emerging story and the hieroglyph of the human soul. Why it is Thoth's library is that ten years into working on this uh, this story on this painting, uh, it, I think. Well, what is the acronym? And it turns out to be T H O T H S. Now that is impossible, but it's also an affirmation because Thoth Hermes is what is known as the teacher of Hermeticism, Hermes, Hermeticism. And this was the teachings of as above, so below of the great mysteries and the great mystery traditions. And the story that Hermes, as he finds the, the, the uh, emerald tablets, 
that he is the revealer of them. He's not the creator of them. He's the Gnostic revealer of them. And he's going to take us on a journey. Now, it's very interesting because this is really does play into what becomes and happens here. And what I like to point out is, again, all of the years, the 39 years, both writing my book and working here, I've been with people that care about these interests. They're interested in these things. So it's never been this battle to go, oh, God, because if I were doing this in public, everyone would want to give me their opinion of why what I was doing was, un, you know, was wrong or they'd do it differently or they'd use a different color. And I tell people, I say, I'm not interested in what you think about my art. I'm interested in what my art makes you think. That's the function of art. Not to critique it. Who cares whether you like an orange painting or a green painting? It's what that painting does. Does it inspire you? If it does, then like music, it's affecting you far differently than judgment. It's not right or wrong. Suddenly you're able to open to something. Your body's able to breathe more deeply. As I say, it's not enlightenment. It's enlighten up. Breathe. Allow <laughs> yourself oxygenate. When in doubt, just take a breath and allow yourself to, to open. And that's what the hieroglyph really became because it, it started, as I said, on 9-11-2001 with a crushing sense of being hated. I had never felt so profoundly hated, truly hated in my life. And when I saw what that level of hatred was able to do, I realized that the game was over. That essentially people ask what patriarchy, well, the Twin Towers were money and God. I have more than you do. And that collapsed. And suddenly the old ways of I have more to justify fell down. And this is why I, I really do feel that the, that the hieroglyph became the journey of Thoth's library of as above, so below. Like I said, my house has as above, so below, but the inner, the middle section is the domestic. And that would be what Thoth would be teaching that he, he, if I can, if I can tell a little story, he would say to the mother goddess, mother goddess would say, well, we're all one. We're telling stories of connection. We are all trees. We, if, if, if she's sick, we're all sick. We need to heal collectively because we know our connection to our roots this is why totem poles, this is why when you look at the Inca, it was all about alignment, about amplification, because we knew where we stood. A bit like actors on stage. If you know the play and you know the role, you honor the play and you amplify not your own personal needs, but you realize you're part of a larger set of needs that you are also connected with. This is what traditional culture gets people off of, a sense of place, a sense of, of meaning because they know where they stand. Our question, and this is really the thought, the, the, the journey we're going to take over from as above, so below, back in the time of the Egyptians. We're going to go from a shared cosmology and gold to a completely lost cosmology and linoleum. That's why Thoth would say, I took you on a journey of direct knowing, as in the time of the mother, when you were aware of who you were and where you came from. And just that level of self-knowledge gives to the heart and the inner self a sense of meaning. And that's very important because we didn't give that to ourselves in this culture. So we don't have that inherent sense of meaning. We have an inherent sense of meaninglessness and an incipient fear that it might all have no meaning. Or if we find meaning, it's only there because I imposed it. But what is brilliant in this, this realization here is that we start downstairs with the 17 years and the 22 steps of the archetypes, meaning that the empress is, will teach you about the empress, the emperor about the emperor, the hierophant about the hierophant, the lovers about the lovers, meaning that each will, like a book in the library, reveal a unique truth. I often say to people, what I want you to do is stand as an acting exercise as the sun, as the, in any of the tarot archetypes, and tell the truth. What you as a tower? Tell me the truth as the tower. Now tell me the truth as the empress. Tell me the truth as death. Suddenly people would say, wow, yeah, I'm telling the truth. But I'm, now I'm telling the truth of death. Now I'm telling the truth of judgment. Wow. Now I'm telling, you see? When we understand that, then we begin to understand truth is not one point of view. It's the center where all of like the books in the library shine their lights down on anyone that stands in the library saying, you are connected to all of these books, not just some of them. And you see how that turns you away from being just this way, again, like a martial art, to being 
uh, to being in context. And that's why the as above, so below, returning us to Thoth's library in a space where for almost 40 years we've had these discussions. As I said, a deep theosophical discussion uh, going very, very deep into the nature and the, the traditions of esoteric uh, philosophy. But if we think even more deeply, what we did here was we said that even though the world is not interested in these things, we are interested in these things. And that's why I feel now that there's a great timeless emphasis being shared with us because only art, art is where we are generous. We never try to instruct with art. We want to inspire because someone who's inspired will allow themselves to teach themselves. And the whole point here is that the arc element is telling us, and this is what the hieroglyph of the human soul tried to say, is that here we are on an arc. And we begin to say that on the arc, certain things are on board with you and certain things are in the water. Wisdom now is realized everything is not on board with you. Some things are in the water. So navigate and don't bring it all to where you live. Where you live should be a place where you can stand in your tradition and say, I am the outcome of a great question. I am the human form divine. And if I give that agreement to myself, I, I allow those deeper qualities of me to find residence in me. If I do not give permission, how on earth can they dwell here? Your words remind me of the, the game a little bit, meaning is our world set up, you know, what the Gnostics might call the matrix, um, the modern Gnostics today, is it set up in a way where it, it is, is like that? It's, it's made to be chaotic to, to find ourselves. Because if, if we look through the, the threads of history, you know, there's the conspiracy side. I know you're not really involved in that. You don't talk about that. Um, but if we look at maybe the Freemasonic side, they believe in these teachings. You know, you mentioned the, the checkerboard, the black and white we see those in the, the Freemasonic teachings. We're here in the United States of America. And if you look at the, the history of the United States, we'll understand that one of the first presidents was a Freemason as well. So do you believe now after all these years of doing your, your work, playing, the, playing in the game a little bit as far as being an actor and seeing Hollywood, but remaining true to yourself, which I believe you've done, Lay, and it's, it's very unique. You're probably one of the few, maybe a handful of people that have done that. I think a lot of the people that haven't, they end up sometimes like Robin Williams um, or Anthony Bourdain. And um, so it, it's great to see someone like you so full of life, but also able to, to play in the matrix on the Gnostic side of the fence. Um, do you believe that it is somewhat set up like that? And um, it is made sort of a, a Gnostic world here in the United States to, to find thyself? That's a very important point because we are taught a religious perspective or scientific we're not taught an alchemical perspective alchemy says everything is so the the alchemical experience you are in the furnace you are in the anguish that this is the very thing that forces one to draw out of themselves that which is compensating meaning that it is our despair that creates our great works of art you know in a sense it's how do i take that which is unresolvable. And, and the, the story here with the artists, because it's, it's a huge art library, the artists say, listen, we were always driven to home. No one ever cared about what we cared about. We were always the ones that said, I realized at the end of the day, I had to care about this. Like Van Gogh, no one ever bought my work. No one cared about it. They thought I was crazy. I'm dead now, but great. <laughs> I had to care about it. That's the passion there, right? Yeah. It's, it's and I and I love the Beethovens in us. I'm deaf. I'm blind. Everyone thinks I'm I'm weird, and I want to kill myself, but I don't. I write the Ode to Joy. That to me, that's the alchemical heroism of the human soul. I'm so tired of a type of religious. Oh, it's about being good or bad, or it's a, or scientific. It's about there's no nothing to do with with passion or humanity. And and those are of course the the two sides of an incomplete picture. That's why Gnosticism or alchemy, gnosis, this direct communion. It's the difference between reading a character on a page and becoming that character. That's the difference in consciousness. Half of the people with consciousness think it's about what they've read the character on the page. But if it doesn't get up within you, if it doesn't go through the difficult alchemy of how do I live this? That's what I love about the room here. 
Because at the end of the day, it's it's that our question is, okay, I love myth, I love all the metaphysics, but how do we make it something we can live with? And that it's become art is the expression. Not when it's this accusation of the Illuminati, of the Freemasons, because I've read probably more than than most humans in this, and I've studied far more deeply, I know, than, than most. And I've drawn out these things, and they have really inner-educated me. And most of the things that are about the darkness and the Illuminati are nonsense. I have to put it quite frankly, it's nonsense. It is people who have a little bit of knowledge and a lot of suspicion. They did it to John D. they did it to Agrippa. They do it because it is not an understanding. It's not that these image ideas and images aren't abused, they are, but it's not the place to put your frame of reference in terms of suspicion. Because all of these traditions, the tarot, all of it is abused or misused. But what I want to bring us back to is these are instruments of consciousness. How they're used can be both beneficent and malevolent. We know this from the secret doctrine and the Tula group, misusing Blavatsky's words to really justify a lot of the work of the Nazis. So when you understand this, you have to be a subtle thinker. It's too easy to say, oh, those are the bad guys. When you understand the play, you say Richard III, yeah, he's the bad guy. Iago's the bad guy. But the play's about the human being that has these bad guys. It's not, I've played so many films. I actually modeled uh, my character, Damian Smith, which I played on General Hospital for a couple of years after Donald Trump 25 years ago. Wow. Because, <laughs> and, and he taught me a lot because it was, I was a nice guy. He said, hey, listen, I'm interested in if you're effective. I'm not interested in good. So it was this, this understanding through archetype that then allows us to see, and for me also with the tarot, we, I created 22 Trumps. They're called Trumps. So it's very important. I see my relationship symbolically because my 16th key, my 16th trump key is Mars, and that's the tower. The tower sets everything on fire, meaning it's about anger. It's about the misuse of anger. It's about blame, about suspicion of others. This is why when we see it as a play rather than politically, we start to realize that we are in this chaotic alchemical soup where everything is extreme. But if we think of that pulling us out, finally saying, all right, this is why we used to show all sorts of documentaries. We have documentary things. And there was a slew of them. And I finally said to my wife, I said, Carly, you know what's really reassuring? As I said, I realized everything is trying to kill us. <laughs> so <laughs> let's relax. You know, so it's like a warrior going, yeah, they're all out to get us. So let's in a sense, respond appropriately. Let's do the due diligence for ourselves. I really think it is. It's trying to get us away from a Piscean mindset, which is around a Messiah. It's around, and you know, it's around a new book and a new set of laws or principles. That'll never happen. We're done with that. We've built the piano. We had to be true to each key, each note, each period of history. But we built an instrument, and that's why the house is at the sea. It's saying, you've come as far as you can. You can't go any further. So the question isn't about where am I getting to? It's about where am I? And if I am the outcome of all of this, the, and I am a quantum system, then what questions am I attending that's allowing this system to build itself? If I, and this is very important because my Phoenix Arise painting, amazingly, creates a fractal geometrical mathematical model of a holographic DNA. With 3D glasses, it's multidimensional. From there, I unfold it, and it becomes a mandala, a blossom. Now, this is very important because this is showing us quite literally through art, through creation, what we are woven in, through ge geometry and mathematics, that we are a functioning organism like a flower. We have come up through the difficult times of emergence, but now we are like this with closed fists, meaning I am so angry, but I'm bringing this anger into my home. I'm bringing it in my heart. But if you think of a plant that is like this, and it is just squeezing tight until finally it goes, I can't do this anymore. And it's going to do this where it lives. It's not going to do it in the world. It's going to say, lay on the couch, go, I can't keep fighting. I can't be this angry all the time. I don't really hate these people. Why am I letting myself be about hating people? I don't hate people. <laughs> and only I can pull myself back from that. And that's why the flower goes, now you see, you're starting to understand that your opening seems like you're going a little crazy but you will begin to understand that you're blossoming 
is when you finally allow yourself to live within the context of your unique ordinariness and honor it as the great gift. This is your golden opportunity to be truly human, to learn from the alchemy of the difficulty, to make it art, not to present as a painting, but art meaning I stepped into the difficulty. I didn't say I had to know. And at the end of the day, I wasn't looking for facts. I was trying to augment a sense of if I can contribute meaning, if I can add some sense that it matters. And that's my great journey. As I said, I want to tell those I love that being human is a noble enterprise. It matters. And no matter how difficult, no matter how damaging that is to so many, we have to honor and say, my God, you went through this, not for yourself alone, but for the whole human story. And at the end of the day, I think we're going to look at those that suffered greatly and understand you know what? It wasn't without context. It was in the not knowing that the suffering was so great. And we couldn't know until we look back and say, what a tree we have grown. And none of us got out of any of the difficulty. We didn't get out of what we didn't like to do it. We transmuted what we didn't like and said, in spite of this, like Job, I choose to love rather than hate. That's when consciousness becomes interested in us. We've matured. <laughs> Tears in my eyes, brother. Tears in my eyes right now. I don't know. You can see them. But um, it's amazing that you were talking to to no one but everyone right now. But it felt like you were talking to me direct. And I know the people that are listening that feel the same. Like you're, you're a conduit of this great energy. And um, that was testament of it right there, bro. <laughs> so, yeah. No, I mean, this energy wants to say, I love you. You are, you are an atom. You are matter, mater, mother. You are woven of the whole and holy context of being human. Trust the library. Trust the imagination. Trust that you're bringing something to the story is what allows the story to change. Yeah, yeah, and, I, yeah and I love that, that the seed, you know, that's how I feel right now, like in this very moment, oh, you know, and you just, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it's like people are so angry. I mean, we can't because we wear it. It's in the zeitgeist. And it's that this is why the fires, they, they are trying to tell us your anger is destroying everything you love. Your anger at the world, your suspicion of others is creating an angry and suspicious world. And only you can say, I see this and this is true. But like the archetypes, right? Let me shift to another mask, another lens. Oh, my God, look at what they're doing to heal this to help there, to help children. Just, to, you know, it's like, it's going on. But we have to be the choosers of this nourishes me. This I can deal with because someone has to be, in a sense, involved with this. But again, my identity is not going to be invested. It's not ego-less, it's ego freedom. How can I use who I am, stand proudly as I am this, but I don't dishonor you? Like a couple of great jazz musicians, man, Let's rip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what's interesting, Lay, is that, you know, listening to your words of, you know, the passion and you're, you're talking about the hate and your words, they struck my heart. They were, they were full of love. And it, it's just, it's unique of what love can do and it can change the world. And um, you're right, Lay. You're right, you know, and your, your assessment. And I'm going to, I'm going to be that, that flower instead of that, that seed that is just bursting. That's how I, like you literally just described me right now, you know? Um, People are the, yeah. No. And think of it, the truth of the center of the wheel. Like if you think of a, like even the tarot mm -hmm. and you spin it, it becomes a gyroscope, right? And a gyroscope lets you give yourself passionately to something, but pull back. You're not going to be overwhelmed by it. And maybe that's what we need to test is in our intimacy, in where we live. And that pulling back allows us to begin to develop a different center. And maybe that is the incrementalism. It's not a big thing. It's an intimate thing. But this is what allows ourselves to be found energetically, not optically. So this is, this is key. What allows um, us to be found energetically, not optically. Yeah. And Beautiful. I think that... Another one. You, you, I, there's some really <laughs> some great quotes here, Leigh. And, and again... Um, I believe you are a conduit for this, this knowledge uh, right now. And I'm really, I've talked to just so you know, well over a hundred people, as far as some of the greatest thinkers 
of our time right now. Um, some maybe not so great, but you know, I've always asked, you know, for them to share their gnosis with the world. And and you're one of the, I'd say the top three as far as who I believe are the real deal in sharing this without any filters. And again, I'm not talking negatively upon any of them, but being a filter for this energy, um, that's what I feel is the big thing that all of us need to be in. And that's being living in truth is to be that filter. And while remaining true to yourself and, and still, you know, being in love and honoring our commitments, you know, um, our commitments to ourself, um, love thyself, um, our wife, right. My partner who I, I married, she's my, my best friend got to yeah. be there for her and my children that I have beautiful souls that I've made with this beautiful being that is my wife that sticks by my side every single day, you know, mm-hmm. and if we, we keep that balanced, right. And then we also keep true to ourselves at the same time and uh, pursue art like you're doing lay, you know, that's one thing that's missing in my life right now. And I, I think I need to head to Malibu in the next six months or so or, or whatever, and maybe come to one of your, your events and, and check it out. And I, I do because I, I feel this very strongly. Like you say, this is what I did. I looked at the eyes of those in love and said, I don't want to leave. I don't want to make my metaphysics about some other where rather than here. I want this to be where I live. I want the truth of cosmos to be not something I have to study and something that I was on another planet or after I die, but to bring it here now to make this life the place that I say, I stay because I choose to love rather than hate. And I will begin with where I live rather than with the problems I have with the neighbor. I really do feel that this is the point, is we are turning to each other and saying, my God, if we see this matters, and we begin our story saying, I begin where I live. I used to start out the front gate. I was worried about what the world thought. I thought my life was, you know what, if it's doing well there, then I'm doing well here. And I never was getting back into where I live. And I think that that's what my life is about, that we really do need to have that duality that says, yeah, the storms and the wind of life will whip you about. But if you find that which you love, it's not home as an object. It's home as a heart. And to me, it is to take a moment to go into a great library and allow yourself not to say, oh, I'm not that. Oh, I'm not that. But to say, oh, my God, I am all of this. And yet I am myself. I have a book to add. And maybe it's not that this or that or that, but they've done it. So what's my book? And maybe it is something. My book had to do with, you know what? For lifetimes, I had turned away. It had always been a battle in the outer world. But in this, I turned toward those I love and say, this time I'm staying. I'm not going to make it about leaving any longer, but about being with those I love as long as I can. And if I can grow a world from this center then the world itself will change because like adding uh, flowers to the drive, people will see going up the street. You didn't have to do the whole street, but you did your part of it and everyone benefits. And the question to the, the audience who's listening all around the world is what is your book? What are your loves? What are you being true to? You've got this life to, to change it. And uh, we choose to, who we give our attention to. Um, Don't forget those people that are sitting right next to you at home uh, while you're on the computer or you're on that phone that are seeking your attention. Dad, can you play with me? Hey, Dad, why does this do that? Why does that do that? And uh, those words, they echo in my head. And um, your words today, Lay, have really touched my soul. And um, another great hour and a half almost here and uh, got to go back to work. I got the real world waiting out there, you know. Um, but I'm going to get to the place where you're at, Lay, and I'm going to be that seed that burst into a flower and with this energy. And I'm going to choose who I pay attention to and, and what I give my attention to and what triggers me. And I, I tell the audience out there, listen to this podcast again. I'm going to listen to it uh, myself several times. And um, there's a lot of great words that Lay had said here, and this is unscripted. And uh, I suggest you check out his great work. And before we wrap up the show today, Lay, where can people find 
you or your great work. I know you're not about social media and being out there. You're actually the opposite, you know? So, <laughs> but I thank you for, for spending your time with us. And if people do want to find anything about you, where's the best place to do that? Really, um, I, I pronounce my name Lee, but I've also, this, but oh, Lee, okay. yeah, Lee McCloskey.com, L-E-I-G-H, McCloskey, M-C-C-L-O-S-K-E-Y. And, and to really Google my name with art or lead, uh, or, or lead, uh, McCloskey.com, um, look around because so much has come up now. Like I, I, I have Facebook. I'm also, I have, it's Olandar Foundation, O-L-A-N-D-A-R Foundation for Emerging Renaissance. Interestingly enough, the acronym for this is OFFER. So it's an OFFER. <laughs> and, uh, but Olandar as well um, is, uh, the pun is all under. I didn't realize it when, when it came to me in a dream, but it's the story that from all under, you see, we grow from unique, intimate places that say, at least here, these things matter. And from that, we grow. So as you look, um, I've got a lot of videos that I, I would suggest, uh, Lee McCloskey videos on everything from the grail to orbs in St. Hildegard to things that I feel, because what I want to offer is the conversation. So look at them, really. And if you have questions, get in touch with me, Lee McCloskey. Uh, dot com. Uh, it, this, it, you know, I'm reachable, and um, let's have a conversation. If you are um, uh, from June 9th to June 15th, I am going to be. I've been asked to give a, a workshop down in Costa Rica at Rhythmia Life Advancement Center, which is an extraordinary place. I was there before, and people uh, have gone there and go through remarkable transformations. I definitely check it out. It's Rhythmia Life Advancement Center. And it's a great place to for people really trying to get in touch with what's going on inside of them. And the last part is really just this sense of giving ourselves permission to really cultivate the garden, to say, I will attend to these things. And as you said about when your, your kid says, can you pay some attention? Realize, and this is when everyone's on their knees out here in Malibu because so many people have lost their homes. So many people are absolutely soul devastated because everything they thought they had is gone. All their memories, all of everything they cherished. And what's even harder is when a disaster hits and the people you love and were there saying, could you pay some attention to me? No longer are. We live in a time of extremes, honor and love and cherish every day and the opportunity to love rather than hate. It will change everything. We're the ones that transform reality because we finally say, I can't do this anymore. I must do this. I must go from this to how may I help. So. Thank you, Lee. This is, it's been great. Um, you know, and uh, you're here for a reason, brother. And uh, thank you for being that flower for all of us and sharing your beauty, your inner beauty with the world and not being afraid to do so. And uh, you. you're welcome. Take care. Bless you, Mom. Bless you. Bye.